Good morning, my dear learners. Get ready to learn new things. A musical day, everyone. Welcome to Music Discovery, the Asian Music Edition. Hello there, my dear learners. I am Sir Jason, your Music Aid teacher. Today is going to be an exciting day for all of us because we are going to explore and discover the music of not just one, but two Southeast Asian countries. But before that, let's have a quick review first. Grab your pen and paper and let's begin. Here's what we had to do. Write through if the statement is correct and false if it is incorrect. Are you ready? Let's go! Statement number one. The gamelan or gamelan orchestra is the most popular form of music in Indonesia. The correct answer is true. Statement number two. The vocal and instrumental music of Indonesia use the Splendro and Pelog scales. The correct answer is true. Let's now proceed to statement number three. Vocal music is not as important as the gamelan because it is only used as ornamentation for the gamelan. If you answered false, you got it right! Awesome! Alright! I hope you were able to get all the correct answers. Now, we can proceed to our next destinations. Make sure to bring your pen and notebook with you because today, we will be amazed by the unique music cultures of Myanmar and Vietnam. Let's go! So, Cambodia has the Pinpit Ensemble, while Indonesia has the Javanese and Balinese Gamelans. What about Myanmar? Let's find out. Music is everywhere in Myanmar, formerly Burma. With more than 100 ethnic groups, each with a unique style and sound. The music of Myanmar is quite like many other musical traditions in the region, including Chinese music and Thai music, probably because its longest land border is shared with China. Just like in Cambodia and Indonesia, Myanmar has a traditional folk music ensemble too, and it's called the Saingwai. The Saing Waing is made up mainly of different gongs and drums as well as other instruments depending on the nature of the performance. Myanmar's musical instruments are categorized into two types, the loud sounding and soft sounding. The loud sounding instruments are performed outdoors or in open air ensembles at ceremonies and festivals. Most of the Saing Waing instruments are loud sounding. Soft-sounding instruments are performed indoors at more formal and classical performances. Some of the best examples are the Saung Gao, a 13-string angular harp with a soft sound, which is the national instrument of Myanmar. The Burmese xylophone called Patala, which is similar to the Onniat of Cambodia. Or the piano and violin, both introduced during the colonial rule period. Aside from musical ensembles, Myanmar also has an extensive collection of classical songs that are usually accompanied by the Saong Gaok, called the Maha Gita, which means Great or Royal Song. These songs are divided into different types, like the oldest repertoires, royal court music, songs of longing, horses dance songs, worship songs for Burmese spirits, and songs of sorrow and music adapted from Ayutthaya and the Mon people of Thailand. I bet you're ready for our next destination. Well then, let's go to Vietnam! Nat Vietnam refers to the ethnic music that originated from the Kin people of Vietnam. This term is also used to address the music of any of the numerous ethnic minorities, including the Montagnard, Degar, Thai, Cham, and many others. Like many other Southeast Asian countries, Vietnam is also known for its beaches, 
rivers, Buddhist pagodas, and bustling cities. Vietnam, officially the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, is located on the eastern coast of Indo-Chinese Peninsula. Although Vietnam is geographically part of Southeast Asia, you will realize that its culture and music are much closer to the Far East than to its Southeast Asian neighbors. This is because of the 10 centuries of Chinese rule in Vietnam. Thus, the early music theory of Vietnam was either based upon or adapted to the prevailing Chinese theory which makes Vietnamese folk music sound like the Chinese. This is why if you notice our beautiful background music, you would be tempted to think that it's Chinese music. And that's totally understandable as Vietnamese music shows the influences of Chinese culture and traditions. Vietnamese music also shows signs of Indian influences noticeable in the improvisation preludes of chamber music known as Rao in the South and Dao in the North. The traditional music of Vietnam can be categorized into three major categories, namely imperial court music, folk music, and religious and ceremonial music. Nanak is the most popular and very renowned type of imperial court music, performed during the Tran dynasty to the last Nguyen dynasty. This form of classical music is also performed in honor of the gods and scholars in temples. Other classical music belonging to this category includes the Dai Nak, which means great music, and the Tiu Nak, meaning small music, which was performed as chamber music for the king. The next category is folk music, which includes diverse music that is performed both indoors and outdoors. Even performers of this category are diverse, from professional musicians down to the blind artists in the streets who perform to earn their living. The folk music of Vietnam is performed on different occasions such as in musical theaters, streets, courtship rituals, and ceremonies for invoking spirits. Sometimes, they can also be influenced by Western elements. Lastly, the religious and ceremonial music of Vietnam. This is simply music performed in religious rituals or at funerals. And that's it for the music of Vietnam. Let's do a short recap. What are the three major categories of the traditional music of Vietnam? The three major categories of the traditional music of Vietnam are Imperial Court Music, Folk Music, and Religious and Ceremonial Music. Great! Do you know what that sound means? It's time for our musical challenge! Let's go! Hello there again! Are you ready for today's musical challenge? Here's what we have to do. Listen carefully to the following saing waing instruments that will be played. Tell whether the following instruments belong to the loud sounding or soft sounding category. Then, classify each instrument according to the horn bostel sax classification or the method used to play it. Ready? Let's now listen to the first instrument. For our first instrument, we have the Saung Gao. If your answer is soft sounding, you are correct. Now, what classification does it belong to? The correct answer is Cordophone. For our second instrument, we have the Maung Sain. Is Maung Sain a loud sounding instrument or a soft sounding instrument? The correct answer is a loud sounding instrument. Now, what classification does it fall under? If you answered idiophone, you got it right! Let's now hear the third instrument, which is 
Pat Wine. Is it loud sounding or soft sounding? If your answer is loud sounding, you are correct. What about its classification? The correct answer is idiophone. Excellent! Wow! That's a job well done! I can see that you've been practicing your listening skills. Well, good for you, my dear learners. Keep it up! Now, for your assignment, choose one traditional instrument of Myanmar. Find any available sound-producing object in your house that could substitute or imitate the sound of your chosen instrument. Record a one-minute video of yourself playing your chosen sound-producing object. Then, post your video on Facebook with the hashtag, Musikashano. There you have it! I can't wait to see your music amazing videos. Until our next music exploration, always remember, one way of learning culture is through music. Once again, I am Sir Jason. And this is Music Discovery, the Asian Music Edition. Come on, come all! You're just in time for an art amazing experience! Welcome to the magnificent world of Asian arts, only here on DepEd TV! Get ready with your paper, pen, and self learning module as we discover the artistic prowess of Asians and listen to the stories told by their masterpieces. I am Serafi, and I heart Asia. Our Art Asian challenges today will deepen your understanding of Southeast Asian artifacts and trace the external and internal influences that are reflected in the design of an artwork and in the making of a craft. You will surely enjoy the spectacular, art fantastic, and art authentic masterpieces. Together with your fellow artisans, Aki and Tina, you are going to perform the challenges that the art master will give you. Thanks, Sir Rafi. Hi, artisans. Your first task today is to unlock three artifacts as we take a tour of Vietnam, Malaysia, and Brunei and get to know the story behind the featured masterpieces. Are you ready? Let's go! In the previous episodes, we have mentioned Vietnamese silk painting. This is one of the most popular forms of art in Vietnam, favored for the mystical atmosphere that can be achieved with the medium. Porta di Santiago Bas Relief of Malaysia most of Malaysia's sculptures are relief. These are partially carved into or out of another surface. The metal sculpture at the ASEAN Park of Brunei. Sculpture in Brunei takes on a more utilitarian role than an aesthetic one. The people of Brunei have a long tradition as excellent craftsmen using bronze and silver to create adornments and functional items such as bowls, tools, and the like. Great job, Archons! You have successfully unlocked three artifacts. Plus, you have learned the principles and stories behind the masterpieces. I am so proud of you! Keep that optimism as you continue on the tour. See you later! Sir Rafi, back to you! Thank you, Art Master, and congratulations, Archons! This time, we will go deeper into external or foreign and internal or indigenous influences that are reflected in the design of an artwork and in the making of a craft. Let's have an art trip down memory lane. Now, we will trace the influences that are reflected in the design of arts and crafts according to the different historical periods in Southeast Asia. The prehistoric period is about the early indigenous cultures of Southeast Asia. It is unclear how and when pottery making and metalworking were first discovered in the region. Initial contacts with India and Southeast Asia 
It came under the influence of Indian civilization towards the end of the first millennium BC, when India, Sri Lanka, and mainland Southeast Asia became involved in the network of trade, along which luxury goods were moved both east and west by sea from Eastern Roman Empire to the Han Dynasty in China. The Rise of Southeast Asian Kingdoms in the 4th to 9th Century The founding myths of later Southeast Asian Kingdoms indicate that Indian merchants settled in these centers. India continued to be a source of inspiration for Southeast Asian cultures for the next thousand years. Buddhist and Hindu devotees visited holy sites in India, returning with first-hand impressions of Indian art and architecture, religious texts, and portable images of Buddhist and Hindu deities. The Khmer Empire in the 9th to 13th century after a long stay at the central Javanese court, a Zenla nobleman returned to the mainland and founded the Khmer Empire of Cambodia. In 802, he gave himself the name of Jayavarman II and built a capital which he called the Mountain of the King of the Gods, in the tradition of central Javanese rulers who call themselves Mountain Kings. Later Kingdoms in the 13th to 16th century the Khmer Empire began to decline slowly in the 13th century. A large part of what had been Khmer land was eventually taken over by the Thais, a tribal people from southern China who became Theravada Buddhist through their contact with Buddhist kingdom of Pagan in Myanmar. For the next four centuries, two Thai kingdoms, one located in the north, the other in what is now central Thailand, vied for power and often fought off Buddhist neighbors from Myanmar. Colonization and Independence In the 16th century, Southeast Asia came under greater pressure from Muslim traders and European seafaring nations. With the exception of Bali, whose population is Hindu, the peoples of Indonesia became Muslims. The Southeast Asian Connection Assimilation and Adaptation the symbols and images of Southeast Asian sculptures strongly reflect Indian influences, which began to penetrate the region early in the Common Era. Now that we already have understood the historical influence of Southeast Asian art, let us discover its functions and styles with your fellow artisans, Aki and Tina. Hello, fellow artisans. I'm Tina, your stylish bestie. And here are the four functions of Southeast Asian art. First, for worship. In India, the majority of sculptures covered all over the exterior of temples for worshipping. Second, for glorifying the king. In Cambodia and in Java, the Devaraja or the God King cult is sculptured and the deities' images in the temple symbolize the God's approval of the king's divine right to rule. Third function is for teaching. Sculpture and crafts in architectural form, extensive narrative reliefs on temple walls performed an educational role by instructing worshippers in both religious and historical events. And lastly, for precious possessions, hordes of jewelry and ritual vessels have been found in Indonesia, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Aki, what do you have there? Thanks, Tina. What's up, fellow archons? I'm Aki, your art buddy. As I was taking the tour, I found out that there are different styles used in Southeast Asian art. Southeast Asian artists visualize the spiritual perfection of the gods in idealized human forms. The sculpture combines sensual forms with a strong architectonic basis, as if the sensuality of Indian sculpture had been merged with the formal, hieratic qualities of Egyptian sculpture. Pose is a sense of dignity and restraint created in the sculpture by an erect posture, frontal pose, and balanced forms. Smooth areas contrast with the rich patterns of the figure's hairstyle and the pleats of the garment and the elaborate way in which it is worn. Southeast Asian deities were often sculpted in the round and in relief. Scale is also used to express the power and complexity of the gods or kings. Sculptures of them were sometimes represented on a superhuman scale while lesser spiritual beings were portrayed smaller. I hope that you will always remember these styles and apply them in the next art activities. Are you curious how civilization art flourished? So Rafi, back to you. Thank you Aki and Tina for sharing what you know with your fellow artisans. Now, let's get to know more art pieces that will surely amaze you. 
In Indonesia, the ceremonial vessel in the shape of an axe head is more than three feet tall and is in the shape of a small utilitarian axe. In Malaysia, the presentation bowl depicted in this picture has not been identified. It may come from the Jatakas, or stories of the past lives of Buddha. The four-armed Avalokiteshvara in Thailand is a life-size bronze image of a four-armed Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, which is the largest figure in a horde of sculptures found buried at a site in what is now northern Thailand. Transcendent Buddha Vairochana in Indonesia is the Buddha of the Zenith, the most important of five cosmic Buddhas. The standing Buddha is derived from Indian models. The face is almost heart-shaped, with a broad forehead, wide eyes, long nose, upturned mouth, square jaw, and small chin. The standing four-armed Vishnu in a symmetrical frontal pose manifests a sense of serenity created by the expression on Vishnu's face, and it is reinforced by the pleasing repetition of circular forms. Krishna on Garuda is a part man and part bird, and he is legendary for his strength, speed, and hatred of evil men and serpents. Standing Uma is one of the sculptures of the Hindu goddess Uma, another name of Parvati, the wife of Shiva who is meant to symbolize the perfect balance between purity and sensuality. This is Cambodia's deified king. Divine kingship was the concept upon which Khmer authority and government was founded, and the cult of the Devaraja, the god-king, was the state religion. Secular art forms also thrived in Southeast Asia like the dish with animals and mounted hunters. This beautiful vessel in Vietnam is in the form of a shallow dish set on a low splayed foot. Java is one of the few places in South or Southeast Asia with a great deal of ancient gold. This bangle with male head or a bracelet is a stunning example of a secular art piece made of gold. Another is the dish from Vietnam with an underglazed cobalt blue decoration. Though real elephants are large and heavy, the one pictured at the center of this plate seemed to float among Chinese-style wish-granting clouds. You see, Southeast Asians have their own unique functions, styles, and themes inspired by culture, beliefs, and traditions, and everyday life reflected in their masterpieces. And to challenge you for the last time, here is the Art Master. It's me again, the Art Master. For your last challenge, you will carve something out of clay, wood, or soap. All you need are clay, wood, or soap, nail pusher, or knife. Here's how you do it. Step 1. Prepare your working area. Step 2. Decide on what design you would like to sculpt on your clay or wood, visualizing the influence of the Southeast Asian countries. Step 3. You can combine colors of clay if desired. Step 4. Start carving. Using a nail pusher and knife may harm you, so be careful in carving the wood. When you're done, clean up your working area. I am so impressed with you, Archons. Always have that optimism towards learning and keep up the good work. I am the Art Master, and I heart Asia. Sir Rafi, back to you. Thank you so much, Aki, Tina, and Art Master. Great job, Archons! I hope you took photos of yourselves while doing the art challenges with us. Post them on Facebook and use the hashtag IHeartAsia. Make sure to include your significant learning as caption of your post. May you have realized the role of arts in enriching and promoting our culture, traditions, and identity as Asians. Keep on watching Devon TV. I am Serafi and I Heart Asia.